So if you have to learn about our financial education, you will learn more about our workshop. We talk about how do you increase your cash flow, debt management. We talk about how to build a strong financial foundation, proper protection, building wealth, asset accumulation strategy. We talk about retirement strategies and we also talk about wealth preservation. Why do we do this? It's mainly because we are on a quest and our goal is to be able to educate 30 million people by the time we get to year 2030. And together with you, we believe that we can help to reach you know, many families to move forward with financial literacy and empower them to build a financial future for themselves. A lot of people have asked this question. You guys have 20, 30 million people goal that you want to get to. Where are you at the moment? We have this counter that tells us how many people we've educated. So far, we've educated 2 million, 272 million, 572 people. And with your help, we know that we can, and we will get to the year 2030, educating 30 million people by that time. Without further ado, there's a group of us in World Financial Group on this beautiful platform that we call ourselves the Good News Crew, which is called GNC. The Good News Crew, as today we've decided as part of our you know, activities for the month of February, we want to talk about the Black History Month. And so we put a you know, a panelist together. Uh, my good friend, um, Regina Aramillo, my very good friend, um, Michael Kekande, and also my good friend, um, George Onami, for us to have a fantastic, you know, session today. I will leave it to this gentleman and lady to take it from here and tell us, you know, about this wonderful topic that, um, you know, we are going to be talking about today. How do we close the racial wealth gap, you know, in the black community? But before I go, there was one statistics that I want to show you guys. I just recently saw this and I thought it was important for us to begin to talk about it. And so please allow me if I can just quickly take a moment to show you. This thing came out just a couple of weeks ago. I saw it somewhere and it's been disturbing personally for me. So today we're going to be talking about how can we close this racial gap with people in the black community? Without further ado, please, gentlemen and lady, you can take it away from here. Thank you so much, Brother VC, for um, just kicking off this uh, this evening. And, you know, I'm super excited for us to have the opportunity to have a conversation. You know, I know that um, February, uh, at least here in the United States, is recognized as, as Black History Month. And um, although we will be sharing, you know, information here in reference to um, Black Americans and, and where we stand, you know, when it comes to the wealth gap and, and finances, you know, I also realize that many of the inequities that we face when it comes to the understanding of money and finances in this country is not just a race problem, it's a systemic problem. And um, and so, but we will be talking about, you know, some of the reasons why these problems in, are in place. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, I hope that as we go through and, and share this content with you, that we can each all take a look at where we are personally. And when we talk about Black history, although we celebrate and we should celebrate the accomplishments of the past, where we have come from, and, but uh, let me tell you, we have a long way to go um, to see where we need to be in the future. And so, although some of what we, we will be sharing today might be might not be new information, some of it might be new information. Um, but I hope each and every one of us can take an organic look at our own self, our own lives. And can we now ask ourselves, am I passing the torch? Am I carrying the torch to pass to the next generation? Or am I diminishing the fire from now being able to take, you know, a big stand towards financial illiteracy in this country? So it's my honor to, to uh, be on this panel today and have the privilege to, um, to share with our guests here and with our members, you know, of World Financial Group. Uh, I have the privilege to, to share this stage with uh, partners that I know share the same passion with me when it comes to financial education, when it comes to wanting to make a difference in our communities, and when it comes to really being proactive about not just educating, but making sure that 
you know, we also learn how to implement and how to make significant change in our future, not just for our family, but for our, our uh, next generations to come and for our communities on a whole. So um, it's without further ado that I introduce to you um, our first presenter um, tonight, and that's Mr. George Onami. Um, George and I have had the pleasure of being a part of this campaign in the Houston, Texas area um, for, for me, it's been uh, 14 and a half years. And for George, it's, it's been over 20 years. Uh, George, you know, started this whole process as, as an IT engineer um, and learning how to, you know, make money traditionally, going the traditional route, what we all do, right? We, we go to school, we get a degree. And we start working in an area, you know, which of which are, you know, we're an expert at, but, and we learn how to make money, but we don't really sometimes learn how to make money work for us. So I'll let George share with you why this campaign is important and what are some of the statistics and some of the things that, you know, he's learned in being a part of World Financial Group, World System Builders, but we also will be referencing some content um, in a book, and George will share a little bit more about um, what we'll be referencing there. So, George, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off over to you to get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Regina, for a uh, wonderful introduction. And I want to once again help welcome all of you to our presentation today, this being Black History Month. And we came up with this idea to share this information because as you know, uh, there's a big disparity in terms of wealth in this country. And even though we're talking about the black community, I think this is something we can all relate to, right? And the contents of what we're going to share is coming from the book, uh, Closing the Racial Wealth Gap, Seven Untold Rules for, uh, for Black Prosperity and Legacy by Eugene Mitchell, right? Let me get a chance to share my screen with you guys. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can see it, George. Yeah, in this book, uh, it talks about uh, a staggering statistic. It says it will take 228 years for the black wealth to reach the current levels of whites in the US if we don't make radical changes in black communities across the country. If you look to the right at the graph, uh, this is the total household wealth, how the total household wealth grew in 2022. And you can see barely at the bottom, uh, this blue representing the black community. The question is what you can see, this is actually an example of what it's talking about on the left, slide, left side of the screen. How long will it take for us to catch up, right? And what, it, what has to change for this to actually, for us to actually have an effective way of catching up and uh, uh, empowering ourselves in terms of building wealth, right? And if you look at the next slide right here, in this book, Eugene Mitchell shares his financial insights and seven and 12 rules that everyone can apply to create financial prosperity and an intergenerational legacy. Join Eugene in this movement toward your own financial empowerment and a collective community transformation. If more than 46 million black people in America were to make better choices regarding where we will spend our $1.2 trillion of annual earned income, so many things that currently seem impossible would become possible. And here are some of the things we could do. Eradicate poverty in our communities, reduce our national unemployment rate, decrease crime and eradicate the school to prison pipeline, increase overall home ownership, mend broken families, further academic or vocational pursuits and enhance existing public education, teach our children necessary money management skills, Foster new businesses and entrepreneurialism, build endowments to support and strengthen our organizations and institutions. And he outlines seven rules that we can actually follow, right? And rule number one, he talks about know yourself, know your worth. The biggest asset that we have is in our lives is who? Is ourselves. The concept of calculating our personal net economic value and what to ourselves and our families and using that number as a foundation for building wealth has been the first major missing and untold rule 
in financial planning strategies in the Black community. In our community, we've been made to believe that our personal value is tied to the tangible items that can be bought and accumulated. Uh, the brand of car that we drive, the passes that we carry, the jewelry, the shoes, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And this is further perpetuated by celebrities and marketers for major, major companies that promote fashion and image as a benchmark for valuation and validation. Blacks spend 25% more on visible goods than their white counterparts. We relinquish our earnings to the benefits of others before our earnings can at least benefit us. This perpetuates an unsustainable, an unsustainable cycle of creating the appearance of wealth without creating actual wealth. In this book, uh, Eugene, he talks about working for a company and rising up the corporate ladder to associate BP. And at that point, he was approached by the human resources to sign uh, a policy Right, the company placed a $2.5 million policy on him upon getting promoted to associate VP in the company. The company was going to be paying premiums even if he left the company. All he had to do was sign on the dotted line. This will benefit the company in case he passed away. And this is a common practice in corporation, which is on corporate owned life insurance. But how did they come up with $2.5 million? He, he kept pondering. And here's what they told him. You're 30 years old. You're going to be making $100,000 a year, and we assume you're going to be working here for the next 25 years. So if you take 25 years by 100000 then your value is $2.5 million. And he, he was astounded that that's, that's how the company saw him, and he kept telling this to uh, other people. And one of, one, one of his friends actually asked him, you know, uh, here's what he said. I'm going to read from the book. Don't you have that much life insurance in yourself? To which he replied, no. My colleague persisted by asking, why not? He went on, don't you realize that if you are to get hit by a bus and don't make it home tomorrow, then your wife and children will not, will not receive that $2.5 million of future earnings. Hence, they probably wouldn't be able to live the life to which they have become accustomed. Your children probably won't go on to the colleges you had, had in mind and your life's dreams for them Will be curtailed. Your church also willn't receive your tithing on that income. The author acknowledged that as a black man in America who was not a rapper or a bowler, there was nothing telling him historically or socially that he was worth that much. And this point, this forced him to now start thinking of himself and valuing himself and eventually getting a, a, a multi-million dollar policy, right? What is a black life worth? By understanding our economic value, we can then work to work, we can then want to protect, build, leverage, and pass on a dollar amount so that each generation is no longer starting at zero. Doing this valuation based on our current earnings potential, we realize that we are a breathing million dollar asset or more. Once we understand this, it becomes unconscionable for us to spend millions of dollars, present and future without purpose, priority and proper placement so that it can increase exponentially. And if you look at the statistics, just in 2016, a study by the FBI estimated that the number of black homicide victims nationally totaled 7,000, almost 10,000. Each of these men will no longer earn $1 million in the next 20 to 40 years. And if you calculate the economic value lost, their debts and or incarcerations will have taken a collective $10 billion away from their families. You do 10,000 by a million dollars. Even more alarming was an April 2015 article in the New York Times titled, 1.5 million black men missing, largely because of deaths and incarcerations. The economic impact of this is a loss in earnings equating to $1 trillion deficit in wages, contributions, and community and national impact. The increase in our economic aptitude and collective net worth are things within our control that have the power to change the landscape for Black people in America. We need to develop a stronger sense of self as a producer, contributor, and builder rather than a consumer. This will begin to break the historic conditioning that we are worth less than others. So rule number one, knowing yourself, know your worth. Rule number two, ensure yourself to ensure others. 
to ensure your future. We first ensure against what can go wrong so we can afford the luxury to plan for what could go right. The best way to be financially free and to feel confident in utilizing our assets productively is to reduce the risk of losing those assets, including our own knowledge and abilities, and abilities, our human life value. Ultimately, we are our greatest assets and we had better protect ourselves fully. This is so that you can guarantee the income stream of your future earnings, human capital, provide protection for your assets, financial capital, and to help fulfill your hopes, dreams, and aspirations in life. My friend Michael will talk about this in details uh, in uh, upcoming slides. And what is an estate? It talks about creating your estate. According to Investopedia, an estate is defined as all of the valuable things an individual owns, such as real estate, art, jewelry, collectibles, investments, and life insurance. But notice, when members of our community are talking about wealth creation, there, continue, there continues to be virtually no reference to insurance as a powerful baseline portfolio tool. It's seen as an expense, as a necessary evil. We try to return to go for what is the cheapest. But here's what um, I found that for the wealthy people, if I may reference this article right here, it says, Producers love insurance because they focus on the price, they focus less on the price of the premiums and more on the cost of not being properly protected. They ensure that the human life value is viable and productive in any situation that they can control, whether they are sick, disabled, or dead. They are able to see the intangible benefits of insurance beyond the tangible premiums and paid claims. By ridding themselves of the fear of loss, they ensure that they maintain a productive mindset. Hidden in plain sight, the author talks about how other communities capitalize on life insurance. If you look at the benefits of permanent life insurance, and you can get with the person that invited you to get more, to get more information about this, here's some of the benefits. You have a tax-free debt benefit. You have tax deferred earnings on your savings. You have tax-free access to your cash values. The cash value you accumulate is protected from creditors and predatory tactics. Most people, when it comes to saving, the vast majority of people have money in either your checking, savings, CD, stocks, mutual funds, 401k. Guess what? If anybody was to sue you, all that is fair game. Why not protect your money from such predatory tactics? If you have a child and the most expensive thing for, for, for a parent is college, did you know that any money, any, any money in a cash value life insurance policy is excluded from the financial aid forms? That means that it's not reported on the FAFSA form or included in the consideration for financial aid eligibility. No wonder you see that some, some people who are, also, who are still considered to be wealthy, how come the kids are still able to get financial aid? You can create your own bank, right? By funding these cash value life insurance policies, you can actually have access to cash value as a flexible source of funds without the questions, credit, check, or paperwork required for bank loans. You can use this for investment projects like a real estate, uh, a life loan for your child, uh, for your child, like Michael is going to share uh, in an upcoming slide. And the author talks about this. Many communities have taken advantage of these benefits for hundreds of years and over many generations to the point that it has become second nature. It has, become, it has become the greatest, easiest, and surest way of passing down generational wealth. Insurance companies collectively pay out tens of billions of dollars every year in debt claims. But guess what? <clears throat> Only a fraction of this wealth transfer goes to African-Americans. So that is my part on this, on this uh, panel presentation. You know, I wanna bring up Regina right now <clears throat> to talk about rules number three, four, and five. Regina, on to you. Wow. Thank you so much, George, for um, just sharing how important, you know, life insurance is as a vehicle for us to be able to protect our lives, protect our assets and our families. So let me go ahead and start sharing so I can take over rule three. Um, 
Okay, you guys tell me if you can see my, I don't know why my screen is showing differently than our PowerPoint is supposed to show. It's showing a pink background and I don't know why. Um, but anyway, I don't know why it's showing a pink background guys, but for some reason, <laughs> Mine is showing a pink background, maybe because I'm a female and I'm, you know, I'm taking over this part, but it just automatically turned my screen to pink and I have no reason, I don't have no clue why it happened. But um, let me go back. Uh, I can't even. Hey, George, George, why don't you continue through your slide and then just click for us? Yes. Yeah. Do you guys see it okay? If you see it okay, I yeah, can continue. Yeah, we see it. We see it. Oh, we yeah, definitely we see it. It's, it's pink. It's pink. It's pink. It's Let good. George see how his slide on share. Okay. Is George going to share it? Do you want me to stop? I shared it. Do you see it, Regina? Are you sharing? Yes, I am. Regina, let me stop. stop. Okay, let me stop sharing. Okay, okay. perfect. There we go. Yeah. All right. So... All right, so rule number three, you can't earn your way to wealth. So, you know, the reason why George talks so much about life insurance and protection, and specifically uh, protection, is because there's a four paramount wealth building practices that Eugene talks about. And these practices are part of the untold rules, you know, for building Black prosperity and legacy. So when you look at this pyramid on the bottom, the foundation that it takes is protection. And that's where we start. But what do you protect? You protect what you earn. So when people say, do you have life insurance? The next question you have to ask yourself, is it enough to protect everything I need to? What I earn, what you own, what you owe, and those you love. So if you want to know how do I put an economic value to that, there's a method that we use called the DIME method. And that method stands for debt, income, mortgage, and education. And if you factor all of those things in, it will tell you what your protection need is. So life insurance is the vehicle we use to get a form of protection, but we have to know what our number is when it comes to what we are protecting. The next thing that we also have to learn when it comes to building wealth is how to plan, you know, how to plan for major pur purchases that we, we look to want to be able to make. College education for our children, if that's the, the route that you want to go, it's not just okay for our children to go to college and finish college with a lot of debt and debt be a way of life for them. If we learn how to plan for college, then you can also utilize the sources and the resources and the money that's there available for our children to be able to go to college with the least amount of out-of-pocket expense. But ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't start when your child gets into their 12th, in 12th grade of school. It starts way before that. See, when you plan, you don't plan when it's time for the event. You plan before the event. And when it comes to retirement, how do we plan for retirement? Are you planning because you're putting a little bit of money in a 401k and you're hoping that that's going to be enough for retirement? Or are you planning for how much money you need to retire with? Because, see, here's the thing. Retirement has nothing to do with how long you worked on a job or how much money, uh, how much money, um, uh, how long you worked on a job or how old you are. Retirement has everything to do with how much money you have. And is it enough money for you to continue to live what will possibly be the next 20, 25, or 30 years of life? If you ask me, this is the place that we don't plan enough for. We all hope to get there, but we absolutely have no plan on what, it, what we should have when we get there. The next step is preservation. You know, how do we maximize on what we are working to build? How do we overcome inflation and diversify our risk portfolios? You know, so when we talk about preserving what we have worked so hard to build, you know, are you considering these? Back, back out. Just hit leave. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Is somebody talking? Yeah, can we make sure can everybody's we muted, mute please? Lines? Thank you. Um, so we need to learn to pre preserve what we have worked so hard for, but then. How is that passed on to the next generation? 
Ladies and gentlemen, the last two parts here, preservation, when we get ready to take money out, and estate planning are the two places that we tend to lose the majority of the money that we have worked so hard to build. And so if we don't understand and know how to utilize these practices, it will be very difficult to build any type of wealth at all. George, you can go to the next slide. Okay. So when we talk about, I look at this financial empowerment plan checklist as a financial house. And so if you want to know, you know, just the same way you built the home that you live in, you build it from the ground up. The foundation being the most important part. If your foundation is not secure, it has nothing. It doesn't even matter what your home looks like. At some point in time, it can easily come, come down because it's not protected, right? And so when we talk about protection, when you look at the slide here, we're talking about, you know, different forms of protection. Everything is important. Life insurance, um, health insurance. Um, um, gosh, it's so hard for me to see this on my screen. I hope you guys can see it. Uh, debt management plan, emergency fund, um, starting short-term funding. You know, all of that is part of building a wealth foundation. So my question to you is, where are you when it comes to your protection plan? And do you feel like you have a good foundation? In fact, not do you feel like it. Are you sure you have a solid financial foundation? And if not, then there's some work that needs to be done. The next is accumulation, wealth accumulation. And that comes with planning, right? And what are the things that we are now we now need to plan for? Wealth preservation through long-term care, annuities, these are products that we use to now preserve that wealth, and then distribution through will, estate planning, and charitable, charitable gifting. When your financial home looks like this, and if you can check off everything that's on this checklist, then you should have peace of mind, which is all we really want, right? Questions we should ask ourselves right now. Have you protected yourself? And have you protected those you cherish? Have you solidified a plan of action or is something codified that you and your loved ones can refer to and rely on? Have you adequately, adequately put mechanisms in place to preserve what you've built? And have you taken the steps to make sure your legacy is intact for those that you leave behind? And go ahead, George, you can go to the next one. So now we talk about rule number four. <laughs> I love this. You know, if you have a landlord and a Lexus, then you have a problem, right? So this one is talking about, you know, where we spend money, how we spend money. And are we, are we really building wealth or we think just because we make an income that we have wealth? You know, I love what he, he referenced here in the book where it says the wealthy teach their children how to acquire. The rich teach their children how to sell and the poor teach their children how to buy. Where are you? You know, where am I? Those are only questions that I can ask myself. But here's the thing. Wherever you feel like you are today, where do you want to be? And I'm so grateful for this campaign that we're in right now that is helping us to, to look at things and to understand where we are to know where we want to go and identify the proper ways to get there. So in his book, he talks about there's a cash flow exercise. Check your spending. Review and analyze three to six months of your past spending. Look at where you've spent your money on. You, there's programs that you can sign up for. Sometimes you can even just look through your own bank account and see. But then meticulously forecast your future spending over the next three to six months. You know? This is a great time, guys, to now look at and decide, hey, where am I and where, where do I want to be? We're just in February. We're in the second month of this year. You have 10 more months to make a significant impact and difference in how you end 2024. See, it doesn't matter how you started this year. What matters is how you end this year. So if you haven't done started to do these practices, now is your chance to do that. Okay, you can go to the next slide, George. So here's here's uh, just uh, some of the statistics he shared. 
you know, when, when it comes to where most people spend most of their money, and this is according to two, 2017, you know, half of our income, guys, is spent in housing and transportation, where we live and how we get, a, how we get around. That is crazy that half of what we be, that we bring in, we just is spent on two things, you know, food. 13% of most income is spent just in food. I believe that that's probably even higher today. Personal insurance and pensions, 11%. Healthcare, 8%. Entertainment, 6%. Between food and entertainment, I think today that's probably even higher. Uh, apparel, but look at where you see personal savings. 3% of the average households only save about 3% of the income that they bring in. So when it comes to where we spend money, you know, Eugene talks about there's a fundamental difference between the ability to purchase something and being able to afford it. We have to look back, step back and see where are we spending money and what type of changes do we need to make? Because ideally we should be saving at least 10 to 15% of our income should come to us. It should come to you first. So when you learn how to pay yourself today by saving, you can pay yourself later when you want to retire. But if you don't learn how to pay yourself today, it's the number one reason why people cannot pay themselves later. So you can go to the next slide, George. Rule number five. And so BC, I guess great minds think alike, right? Because the same thing that you shared earlier when it comes to where we stand as, as Black Americans, um, Hispanic and white when it comes to, you know, the net worth that we build just by our race, man, you can see a huge, huge difference in where Black Americans face, where Black Americans are when it comes to building our net worth. So rule number five says, it's, it's not what you make that counts, it's what you keep. See, many of us are always chasing the dollar, right? We want to make more. Let me get this raise on my job. Let me add another. I need a second job. So we make more, but we don't necessarily keep the money we make. And so if you don't understand where your money is going, and if you don't understand how to build wealth, then you're just chasing, you're just, you know, you're like a hamster on a wheel going round and round and round and not really getting anywhere. So when it comes to wealth, wealth is the net worth of a person. That's the total value of his or her assets minus liabilities. Whatever you own minus what you owe is what your net worth is. Income is the amount of money that a person receives in return for his or her labor, services, and sale of goods or profits from investments. That's income. See, you can have money today but not be building wealth with that money. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So uh, George, you could go to the next, um, the next slide. Um, so Eugene talks about in the, in, in, in the book, access your wealth and your health. All areas of your, of your life proliferating health, wealth. Are you as wealthy from a health and a wellness standpoint as you are from a monetarily standpoint? Guys, it's very important that we start to evaluate and look at, you know, where we stand when it comes to health. Because one of the number one reasons for bankruptcy in this country is a health, a, an unplanned health event. It's the number one reason why most people end up having to file bankruptcy. So do you suffer from chronic illness, pain, or fatigue? If you don't, have you protected yourself against that? Because here's another thing. The longer we live, the more chances we will need some type of protection against pain, fatigue, and chronic illnesses. Okay? But also, do we have wealth of education? See, in order for us to start building wealth, we have to be educated. Many of us spend years getting in debt for a degree, but we don't even spend hours learning about money and how money works. Are we reading books, taking classes, and learning 
to get better in this area of life, in our financial area of life. I love the fact that with World System Builders that we have workshops and our workshops are prepared to help people to learn and then also how to apply. If you haven't taken advantage of these complimentary, work, complimentary workshops, I hope that you talk to the person that invited you onto this call and find out how you can take part in our complimentary workshops so you can learn how to manage your own money. How are you enriching all other areas of your life? See, we have to take some time out. We got to take time out to do our own personal assessments. We have to know where we are and we have to know where we want to be. That's the only way that any significant change is ever going to happen. And I'm just so grateful that I'm in a I'm in an organization where this is I'm immersed and many, many people can be immersed. And I hope some of you will join our campaign after today and want to learn more about how you can make money and make money work for you. So I'm going to bring up our next uh, presenter here. Um, George, if you want to stop sharing, um, I'm going to bring up Michael Kakande to go through the next two steps of the seven step series of, of our book. Uh, Michael, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, I think I see you there and I guess you can share from there. Yes, my sister, good morning. And good morning, everyone. Um, it's morning every single time with WF with WSB. Um, my name is Michael. I welcome everyone who is here. I'm just sharing in a little bit. Um, yeah, that's my name. Uh, this is just an advert. I'm a performing artist um, and a former radio DJ, and I. I lead a team that has educated um, over 1,000 uh, people in this campaign where we want to educate 30 million people by 2030. So um, just to add on what Regina and my brother George said, we are trying to close the gap, the racial gap, um, especially when it comes to finances. And we have to understand where we come from so we can play the best way for the future. One of um, the authors said, rich people plan for generations as poor people plan for Saturday nights. I am an artist. I definitely want to plan for a Saturday night, but what am I planning for the future? What, how um, often you can is- You go right there to your audio. That's why I will select the speaker. Can you please here, mute if you're talking? Michael, yes. continue. Thank you. So how how often do you sit down with yourself to plan for your future and for your fu for your future generations? Um Michelle, just uh just like Michelle Obama once said, we've got a responsibility to live up to the legacy of those who came before us by doing all we can to help others that come after us. So what are you doing? that is going to change the lives of those who are coming after you. Remember, somebody is yeah, sacrificed. Can, yeah. okay. can we Keep just... going, Mike. We got you. We got you. Go ahead, bro. Okay, thank you. Somebody just sacrificed to be where you are today. What's your sacrifice for those who are coming after you? Remember we, we, when we had um, uh, when we had the slave trade? Then we came to racism and segregation. Then we came to Black Lives Matter. There is somebody, there is already somebody who sacrificed themselves to make sure you are where we, who you are. But what are you doing? Malik Lee said, you may have to sacrifice something you need or want so that the person behind you can jump over you. So, how do we create generational wealth for at least three generations? When you read that same book, he was categorically clear. He shows you how you can basically build your generation 
within the, 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 the three generations, building wealth within the three generations. Generation one is your parents. You can start from where your parents are if they are still here. Guess what? You can together as siblings pull resources and put life insurance onto your parents. A financial professional like us can explain to them that this is a legacy, uh, that you're trying to create a legacy that will help their grandchildren um, to go through college and buy their first houses. They will love it. They, you just have to bring that idea to them. Then when you pull the resources, you're going to pay for that insurance. But guess what? You are bringing resources to you and your children. The financial professional will look into a suitable policy, which could be a joint life, which covers both parents, or an individual policy, which covers each one alone. I have an example for you here. This is a joint survivorship policy, which actually covers two parents, one of which is 60 and another one is 50 years. They, they can be on the single policy. Now, imagine... As siblings, you come together to probably ask for uh, a policy of 300,000. And this is, you're, you're only paying something like $385 together. Okay? Now, when you do that, you only have to do that for uh, around 20 years. Let's say in the 30th year, when, you're, when one of them is 94 and the other one is 79, you've only contributed $85,000. And guess what? You have cash value in that account of around $135,000 and you can access it if you want it. But even when they pass, you still get $300,000. But guess what? If the surviving insured or both insureds become chronically ill, the death benefit could be accelerated to provide income up to 6,000 per month. 6,000 per month. Just imagine you and your sibling bringing money together to put life insurance onto your parents. And then they get 6,000 per month in case they can't perform active, uh, two out of six activities of daily living. So that's an investment that you're doing there. And if you, you have a guaranteed life insurance. Generation two is you. Work on yourself. Remember that your personal financial replacement value is 20 times your income, where the 20 represents the number of years you will live after retirement. Have you thought about how much you're putting aside every month for your own future? Let's do the math. If you save $100 per month, then you will have 108000 after 30 years. Will that be enough? If you save $500 per month, you will have 180000 after 30 years. You save 1000 you will have 360000 after 30 years. So you have to think about where you want to be and then plan for what you have to do about where you want to be. How much do you want to have versus how much do you want to save? How much you will have depends on how much you save and how much time you have. Remember the wealth formula? The wealth formula says you must, first of all, create an income. You must have money. If you're looking at having some money later, you must have money today. So create an income, have money. Then you must have enough time. Give it time to grow. And then look at the rate of return. How much, how much does your $100 bring you? And then put into consideration the inflation. And then what is the impact of taxes on your income? And you will have a balance of wealth. Can you think about reducing on your expenditure so you can save more? Have you thought about replacing your car for a cheaper one, for example? Have you thought about starting to cook from home instead of eating out? 
watching that movie from home instead of the cinema hall, cutting off that cable that you're not even watching? Have you thought about working an extra job to save more money? How about working with us part-time and you cut your own check? You become your own, uh, your own boss. You become your own boss. This is an example. I have an example for you. For a 30 year lady who decides to work with us, let's say she can, by the time she comes to work with us, she can only save $300 a month. That's $10 a, a day. Can you save $10 a day? Because if I tell you to save a thousand, I will look crazy. But how about start with $10 a day? Come work with us. Now, with this 30 year old lady, if she gets an insurance policy, this insurance policy specifically is called an indexed universal life insurance, which will give you uh, different benefits, just like George said. Now, in this example, this 30 year old starts with $300 a month, which is 3,600 a year. And because she is working with us, she has that extra income. So later on in the second year, I'm assuming she can have $500 to save. So in a year, she will have saved $6,000 in her account. And then of course, in the third year, probably she gets a, a, a bigger contract. When you work with us, you gain more experience. Definitely, your income is going to increase. When your income increases, the first person you have to think about is yourself, saving for yourself. So in this example, in the third year, this lady now has got some good money. She can put some $1,000 a month away. So if she does that, guess what? By the time she retires at age 67, she will have contributed a total of $429,000. And guess what? She will have around $1.37 to access. Tax-free. $1.37 to access tax-free, having contributed $429,000. And guess what? In case she dies at that moment, her family, she's leaving a legacy worth $2 million. And what did she do? She started with $10, worked with us, and then because she now has the income and she has the knowledge. Okay? Then generation three is who? Your children. Remember, we are working on improving the generation, three generations, your parents, you and your children. The best gift you can ever give your, ch your children is to lock them in their investment at their young, their young age. If you lock an investment at that age, they are going to pay the same amount of money forever, which is relatively lower than you actually pay yourself. What's your plan for your child's college fund? Are you thinking about it? What's the impact of your child's savings on the eligibility to free application for federal students' aid? Have you thought about it? Where do you put that child tax credit refund you get? Every, every year when you go to file your taxes, you have some money. Guess what? I was going through uh, the recent statistics, and this is what they say. The American Rescue Plan increase the child tax credit from 2000 per child to 3000 per child for children over the age of 6 and from 2000 to 3600 for children under the age of 6 and raised the age limit from 16 to 17 hold on there imagine you get that 3 $3,600. Let's say you just had a child at the beginning of this year. You get that $3,600 a year and put it in an IUL, an indexed universal life insurance. If you do that, remember this, yes, uh, they say the age limit is six, it was 16 and now it is 17. Now let us, let us imagine 
you put that money, 3,600 from this year, okay, until your child is 17. And then you go to the target premium, which is the normal premium that you're supposed to put in this account. Guess what? After 20 years, when your kid is 20 years, you will have contributed only 64,000, not from you, from the government as a tax refund. And your child will have 113,000 tax free. 100, actually, this is this is a wrong figure here. Look at this. 113,000 tax free, okay, to go to to pay for their college. Why should they get a, a, a loan when they have a tax refund coming in your way? Where do you put that money? How about wills and trusts? After setting up your legacy, you need to protect it. Have you ever imagined your stepsons, your uncles, your aunties laying claims to your inheritances? Have you ever imagined your family going through the probate court to claim what is rightfully theirs? Have you ever imagined your children, because they now have a lot of money, they buy those fancy cars, they go to the expensive trips and boom, they use up all the money. Now you need to set up an estate plan to make sure your, your, your legacy is protected. Pro, uh, estate planning helps you to provide for how your assets should be disposed at your at your death. Choosing the people who will make decisions when you're gone. Creating trust for your heirs who may lack the maturity or talents to manage inherited assets. Providing for the guardians of any minor children. Minimizing any state and or federal estate taxes. Reducing your heirs state and federal income taxes, and minimizing the sources of potential conflicts amongst your family members. That's why you need to have an estate plan in place. Where can you get it from? Just utilize the person who invited you on, uh, onto this Zoom call. They will lead you to where you need to set up all that. Would your family get all your money in, in case you pass? Just think about it. We, we are working so hard, right? Making that money, saving it in banks, saving it wherever you put it. You have those wills in case you have them. You have those land titles in case you pass. Will your children or your family get access to that money? In Massachusetts, where I live, the most popular advert is unclaimed money on radios. There is a lot of unclaimed money because people die and their family don't even know they had money. How about we help you streamline? Through what we call Tenzi, you can get an immediate online access to your most valuable information while protecting you from unauthorized access to your personal data. This unique information storage platform, fam Family Bonds, Everest is concierge level service and best in class security to protect your valuable information. So all that fin uh, financial records, your usernames, your passwords, your estate plans, your memberships, your photos, and other personal documents can be safely archived. And in case you pass, your family can actually be able to um, to, to get access to, the, to that information. But they can't access it when you are alive. Have you ever thought about that? Guess what? We, on, we don't know what we don't know until somebody who knows comes to talk to us. And here we are talking to you. Just get back to the person who invited you and make sure you, um, you bring this information to, li to, to life and take action. Thank you, my brother, my sister, Regina. Awesome. Thank you, um, Michael, for going through the last couple of steps there. Um, and to close us out this evening, we're just going to spotlight um, a very well-known, you know, uh, artist. Most of us know this gentleman um, 
who has passed away, but we just want to share a very practical example of what happens when you don't have the proper things in place. And it doesn't matter how much money you make or how much money you've kept. If you don't know how to transfer it properly, you know, you will lose a significant amount of, uh, of money through wealth transfer. So um, I'm going to ask our uh, brother, Mr. Uh, brother Osman, if you can um, join us here and close out um, our presentation today with the case study of um, um, Prince's estate. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Sister Regina. Hey, hey, Michael, amazing job to the three of you. Absolutely, um, you know, are we proactive to make money? We need to be proactive to preserve that money too. Not only grow it, but we need to save it too. Um, I'm going to share with you guys uh, one of our brothers who is very, very famous, very, very talented too. He is one of the, probably the only guy who fought with the music industry because there was a time when, when you sign a contract with that music industry, even your own name, they have the right to it. So to bust through that, he came up with a very intuitive way wherein he used a symbol and called himself the the artist formerly known as Prince, just so he can release an album and more or less the music that you want to put there and get the full credit for all of it. Let me share with you guys, even with how smart it is, why the last topic that Michael talked about by estate planning, how important that's, that is, okay? Let me just get to my slides here. Something. You guys, please bear with me. All right, let's see. Uh, uh, you know, Prince, you guys remember this guy? Yes. When he died, actually, it's funny when he died, his, his, his estate was like it is something million. But when he died, all of a sudden people became interest in, have an interest in his estate. So by the time six years later, when they settled his estate, he grew to 156 million. Now watch this. He settled approximately $84 million. That's what he pays to Uncle Sam and the state of Minnesota. Because out of the $156 million, the only exemption the time he died was $5,000. So which means that $151 million was subjected to 40% estate tax. That's the first step. The next one, in the state of Minnesota, because why is this important? In the state of Minnesota, the only thing they exempt out of the $156 million, guess what? It's $3 million. Please find out from your state. Because sometimes you might think that, because right now it's about 11, 11 point something million dollars that's exempted for federal estate. But state estate, the threshold is so small. So watch that. So even that's only $3 million they exempt. So $153 million is subject to another 16% in state estate tax. Now, the bank, because they need a bank to settle whoever they want to pay for and go through all the litigation, pay the lawyers and everything, that bank, for their effort, the estate judge is the one that makes the decision. The, the judge that the government put to take care of his estate, they pay that bank $3 million just to file paperwork, pay whoever they need to pay. Yeah, they earn $3 million from that. His family of six siblings. They only get a million dollars each in cash, of course, plus future royalties. That's a travesty. Now look at this. He settled for 56 million, 56% of his estate, went to Uncle Sam and the state of Minnesota. So what all the concept that he shared with you guys this evening, let's, I just did a, 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 a thing here. Assuming that I'd met Prince 15 years before he died, and I put it into some of the programs that we have to save him estate taxes. Let me just, you know, jump into that here. Let's say I've given him a $20 million life insurance. And of course, he can afford $15,000 a month. He can afford it at that time. So he did that 15 years later when he died 57. He will have put about $20 million into it, right? And... The investment, that $20 million, even though cost of insurance coming up, he will have grown to $30 million, which means that they will have given his family $50 million tax-free. 
Let's look at this. Let me summarize this. He started, if he had done a policy with me, paying $115,000 a month, right? That's, you know, uh, that's $20 million he would have put in 15 years. And what I show you here is this program, the investment part of it, it can give you up to 13%. Uh, 13%. And the minimum you make is 0.75%. They already talked about it earlier on. So let's summarize this. For him to have made that move 15 years before he died with me, that means that that $20 million would be taken away from his $156 million estate that dropped that amount that is left. He would have grown it an extra $9 million in profit and a debt benefit of $15 million that will go to his family tax-free. What that means is that $20 million, like I said, will have reduced his estate by $20 million. And he has a settlement of $50 million. His estate tax settlement will, will, will have settlement to 73000 73 million rather. Let me, let's look at this. That means the only thing, because that 73000 when you subtract the $50 million that they get from the taxes, the estate would have only have to pay $22 million in estate tax. That's only 14%. It's not just for Prince. Each and every one of us here, the last topic that Michael shared, take it seriously. You need that. Get with the person who invited you tonight and make sure you put these things in place for you. It's even worse than what we share with you, the way things are going in this country. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brother Osmond, um, for sharing that. Thank you, everybody, for joining us um, tonight. Uh, like Brother Osmond said, please don't let this just be good information. Let it be information that you implement as soon as possible. Um, because, you know, nothing is promised to any one of us. And so we have to make sure when we hear something that we act on it immediately. So thank you for giving us a chance to, to come into your households uh, and to, to share a little bit about Black history um, for Black History Month. You know, like Brother Osmond shared, there's a lot of information out there. What you don't know will cost you. So we're opening up that, uh, that opportunity for everybody to have as much information as they need and now to start implementing the, the proper plan for you. So good evening, have a great night, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event um, and definitely on our workshops um, that we do Monday through Friday, sometimes three times a day. So please take advantage of those. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. all. Have a good night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.